Well, welcome to uh, Reservoir Geomechanics. Um, as the uh, subtitle of the course uh, indicates, uh, it's about combining knowledge of the stresses in the earth, the forces in the earth, uh, with the principles of rock mechanics. We'll use uh, structural geology, we'll use petroleum engineering, we'll use uh, earthquake seismology. We're going to integrate a lot of these different fields to address a number of problems of, of direct relevance to oil and gas reservoirs, um, as well as uh, geothermal reservoirs, problems related to CO2 sequestration, and things like that. Uh, the term geomechanics is sort of a new term. It's kind of become popular in the last few years. Um, it means different things to different people. Uh, what it means to me is this, this integration of uh, knowledge, quantitative knowledge of the forces that are in the earth with quantitative knowledge of the physical properties and characterization of the earth to then solve problems of uh, practical uh, importance. Uh, today's lecture is just sort of an overview. I'm uh, asking a lot of you uh, to engage in uh, carrying out, uh, to, to sitting through uh, uh, 20 lectures, uh, doing eight homework assignments, and so on. So I want to give you an idea of what we're going to cover uh, and, and where, where we're going. Now, <clears throat> why is geomechanics important? Why has this field sort of developed over the last uh, 10 to the 15 years um, coming from sort of nowhere? Well, um, in a real practical sense, if you're in interested in drilling and reservoir engineering, problems like compaction, compaction drive, subsidence, uh, production-induced faulting are all real problems that people face every day. Uh, a parallel problem is optimizing drainage of fractured reservoirs. Many, many reservoirs around the world are, the, uh, are fractured, and those fractures are essential uh, uh, to the production, and we need to understand uh, those reservoirs uh, in order to optimize production. Um, hydraulic uh, fracture propagation, uh, here's the first typo of the course. Uh, hydraulic fracture propagation is controlled by the stress field, and uh, we'll talk about that. And uh, obviously, hydraulic fracturing has been important for a number of, of years, but has gotten uh, increasingly more important with the development of unconventional resources, where the matrix permeabilities are often on the scale of nanodarcies as opposed to milladarcies or, 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 or even darcies. Wellbore stability is a huge problem. It uh, costs industry literally billions of dollars a year, a year uh, lost time due to unstable wells, and it's geomechanics that helps us uh, understand those problems and avoid them as subsequent wells are, are drilled. Um, anyway, uh, a number of important problems related to drilling and reservoir engineering. On the more uh, geologic and geophysical side, again, this is uh, you know, where fractured reservoirs are important. Pore pressure prediction is extremely important. When we're in a sedimentary basin where pore pressures are elevated at depth, what I'll show you is it has a major control on the stress field. Okay, pore pressure and stress are, are, are closely coupled. And when pore pressure is extremely high, it's very hard to drill because you have to balance the mud weight, the density of the drilling mud, between the pore pressure, it has, the drilling mud has to be higher than the pore pressure so the well doesn't flow, but lower, the density has to be sufficiently low that while it is greater than the pore pressure, it's less than the least principal stress because if the pressure exceeds the least principal stress, you'll accidentally hydraulically fracture the well. And this is what's referred to as the mud window the safe operating range of pressures between the pore pressure and the least principal stress. And we need to be able to predict pore pressure in advance of drilling so you don't either have a blowout because your pressures are too low or you have a collapsed well because you fracture the well unintentionally and all the drilling mud then disappears out the fracture and then suddenly um, the well collapses. Okay. Um, a number of other geologic problems are of interest, for example, fault seal integrity, understanding how reservoirs are compartmentalized, understanding hydrocarbon migration. You know, the buoyancy of hydrocarbons, of course, is the main driving force uh, for their movement, but exactly how they move, right? Are they moving through the matrix permeability of a given formation? Are they moving along conduits, fractures, and faults um, under what 
conditions is that migration sort of a dynamic process, an interplay between pressure um, and containment of I, by, uh, by either um, the fault or the hydraulic fracture. And compartmentalization is a big deal. Imagine that you were working for an oil company, you've identified a reservoir, you've mapped faults in the reservoir. Are those faults compartmentalizing the reservoir such that you need to drill a well in each one of the compartments, one or more wells, to produce the hydrocarbons? Or will there be fluid flow across those faults and you need far fewer wells? Well, we have some ideas about how to predict that. Of course, uh, for about the last 10 years, you know, we're all aware of the, the shale gas revolution, the, the ability to drill horizontal wells and carry out multiple hydraulic fractures to produce initially um, natural gas from these extremely low permeability source rocks, right? The organic rich shales from which the hydrocarbons originally, uh, um, you know, were derived. And so, you know, producing natural gas directly from the source, not from a reservoir, and overcoming the extremely low matrix perm. Now that technology is being applied more broadly to um, tight oil reservoirs. And so what's happening now around the world is horizontal drilling and multi-stage hydraulic fracturing are being used to go back to re you know, reservoirs that have been recognized for many decades, but they were uneconomic to produce until being able to you know, increase production through this uh, horizontal drilling and multi-stage fracking process. This is a, a research, a field of research that my, uh, my group has been very much involved in. Uh, and so toward the end of the course, um, I'm going to take everything that's come before and then uh, put it in the context of this. I'll describe this uh, in a little bit more detail in a few, a few minutes. In the course, we're going to follow uh, a book that I uh, wrote and originally published in 2007 called Reservoir Geomechanics. The book is divided into three sections. The first section, chapters one through five, is on, uh, is on basic principles. Um, the, sec uh, the second section is on you know, how we actually come up with this measurement of the stress in the earth. Uh, uh, for many, many decades, people struggled with this problem uh, because you, know, you can't see stress. You can see deformation and strain. You can see faults. But you can't actually see the force that's in the rock. Uh, stress is most simply defined as force per unit area. And it was thought to be almost an intractable problem. But over the last 30 years, a series of techniques um, have been developed that allow us to actually quantify the force. And, and you can think about it in a very simple way. If we want to understand whether a rock is going to fail, perhaps this is a rock sample in the laboratory, uh, the failure of that rock is going to be controlled by the intrinsic strength of that rock and the forces that you apply. And it doesn't matter how much you know about the strength, if you don't know anything about the forces, you're not going to be able to say anything about its potential failure. And so you need both sides, um, you know, uh, both types of information, um, you know, to be able to address, uh, address the question. Uh, and it's the same question when we get around to the slippage of faults. It's the same question of as we decrease pressure due to production, whether a, um, a rock is going to start to internally collapse, whether we'll have inelastic compaction. In all of these things, we need to know both about the rock and about the stresses, and then we can ask ourselves what the effect of any perturbation might be. Okay. And the third part of the book is, is, to is on applications, um, as, as I mentioned. Uh, the syllabus is uh, pretty straightforward. We're just going to plow through the book uh, in a sequence of, uh, let's see, 16 lectures, uh, starting with, with the next lecture, uh, which will start with chapter one. Um, distributed through the lectures are a series of homework assignments that basically build on the principles that, um, you know, it's one thing to say, OK, we're going to determine the vertical stress as the first step in building a geomechanical model. The vertical stress is the result of the, the weight of the overlying rock. We can learn about the weight of the overlying rock from something like a density log, which are routinely collected. But OK, so that's, that's it. You got it. Um, but when you actually you know, sit down with a density log and you actually try to calculate the vertical stress, there are 
are always some little idiosyncrasies that sort of make you think. And throughout the course, all eight of these homework assignments are intended to sort of illustrate and build upon the principles that are discussed in the lectures, discussed in the book, but to, to give you sort of a hands-on feel for what real data look like so um, you know, that you can actually uh, go through this and, and do it on your own um, at some time in the future uh, out, outside the class. The same thing is true uh, for poor pressure prediction, which is the second chapter of the book. The same thing is true for rock strength. Now, you know, the I ideas surrounding uh, rock strength and sort of rock mechanics in a sort of a modern view have been around for 40 or 50 years. But the practical issue is that in the oil and gas industry, you have very few core samples. You almost never have core samples of the rocks outside the reservoirs. And for example, if you're facing problems of wellbore stability, the issue is not the reservoir necessarily, it's getting to the reservoir. And it's that overburden that you need to understand and the variation of rock strength. And the only information we typically have comes from geophysical logs. And so we'll go through the exercise of estimating rock strength from geophysical logs. And then we'll talk about faults and fractures. Uh, faults and fractures in rock are, are extremely important in many, many different contexts. Um, and we'll work with some real data and uh, you'll actually analyze the fault and fracture data. And then you're going to use that uh, information later in the, in the subsequent uh, homework assignments. Now, the middle part of the course is related to you know, measuring stress. And this would seem to be, uh, well, why don't I just give a lecture on measuring stress and be done with it? Well, it's taken me about 30 years to sort of have an idea about how we measure stress or how we um, estimate stress or how we put bounds on the stress. And what we want to do, of course, is use the data coming from the place of interest. And we'll take some time to go, to go through all that. And I'll, I'll make some illustrations of these principles here again in a few minutes. As I mentioned before, the stress field controls hydraulic fracturing. Um, we want to talk about that. Uh, and it, it turns out that hydraulic fracturing, small scale hydraulic fractures, are the best way to understand one component of the stress field, the minimum principal stress. Um, we're going to talk about the failure of wells. What do I mean by the failure of wells? Is obviously we drill cylindrical wells, but they don't stay cylindrical because of a stress concentration around those wells that actually affect the well bore wall. Well, this is something we can, we can study, and this is something we can use to make estimates of, of what the stress magnitudes are. And then we'll conclude the middle section with this global review of the state of stress in sedimentary basins uh, around the world. Uh, the third part of the book, the applications, well bore stability, uh, critically stressed fractures and faults. That means faults in the earth that are close to the point of failure. Faults in the earth that, with a small perturbation, can be caused to slip. Faults in the earth that are in this state tend to be permeable compared to other faults in the Earth's crust. So in other words, faults which are mechanically alive in the current stress field are also hydraulically alive. So this idea of a critically stressed crust is something that's going to come back over and over again in this class and is important in many, many different ways. Then we'll talk about applications to this uh, fault seal and dynamic hydrocarbon migration uh, process that I referred to uh, before. We'll talk about what happens in reservoirs when we deplete them, when we change the pore pressure. And we'll talk about issues uh, of compaction, weak sands, um, and uh, surface subsidence. And then um, we're going to conclude the course with these three lectures I mentioned earlier, two lectures on horizontal drilling, multi-stage hydraulic fracturing, exploitation of these unconventional reservoirs. And then the final lecture is going to be on a topic that has gotten to be um, extraordinarily important in the last couple of years, and that's the problem of geomechanics and triggered seismicity. Um, occasionally, very rarely in fact, uh, earthquakes are triggered during hydraulic fracturing, but because of the development of uh, these unconventional resources, 
the water that flows back after hydraulic fracturing picks up contaminants um, from the shales and there's a lot more fluid injection, wastewater injection going on today than has gone on in the past and what we're seeing is the occurrence of injection induced seismicity um, in many many places where earthquakes are uh, normally would occur very infrequently. I'll get back to this um, in a bit more detail um, at the end of the lecture today. Now one of the ways of sort of proselytizing about geomechanics has been to, to consider describing a reservoir geomechanically like describing a reservoir um, geologically or describing a reservoir uh, with respect to its flow properties for reservoir simulation. But instead now we're going to try to describe it geomechanically and which means building a geomechanical model, right? And I'll, I'll show you what the components of that model are here in just a second. And the purpose of this slide is to put the process of oil and gas development in sort of a historical framework and think about geomechanics in that same framework. So for example, um, you start with exploration, okay? Suppose you find a reservoir, you need to appraise the reservoir, you do more drilling, you find out, you know, what the potential resource is like. Then you develop a development plan, you start drilling and producing the hydrocarbons um, through what's called harvest. And then, you know, as production declines, you go through various secondary uh, and perhaps even tertiary recovery techniques. And finally, uh, you abandon the reservoir. Through that life cycle, which will take, of course, decades, um, a lot of problems arise. For example, poor pressure prediction and well bore stability are problems that you have to face early on. You don't want your wells blowing out. You don't want your wells uh, collapsing. Okay? As you appraise the reservoir and start to develop it, you start to ask yourselves questions about um, fault seal, right, and compartmentalization. How many wells are you going to, to need? Um, as you, in, in other types of reservoirs, you, you know, you might be very interested in what fractures are present. And what do they mean for permeability and isotropy in your development scheme? In other reservoirs, perhaps they're very weak sands or weak chalks, and you're very concerned about how much you you can produce the reservoir without causing irre irrevocable changes in the reservoir properties, depletion related compaction, okay, and, and so on and so on. And so the point uh, that I, I emphasize, uh, again with sort of a religious fervor, is that in the wells that are drilled in the very first part of the exploration process, you have the ability to build a geomechanical model and you can then use that geomechanical model through the lifetime of the reservoir to solve these problems as they arise. You don't have to build that model over and over again. But, of course, your model will be a lot better as you go along than it is initially. You'll have, you know, uh, uh, more limited data um, at the first part of the process than, than along the way. But this is a very tractable problem. All the things that we're going to talk about, whether they're uh, it's the rock properties or the fractures or the stress are going to vary from place to place but they're going to vary in sort of a coherent way and what we're going to start doing is building uh, that model early on and then we're going to test that model um, as the drilling goes on and refine that model uh, but nonetheless you can start very early and take advantage of that there's no point in struggling with problems of well bore stability for dozens and dozens of wells and, and then finally you, you know uh, say a well bore collapses and you lose, um, you lose everything for that particular well, when in fact the very first wells you drilled contain the information you need to avoid those problems subsequently. Okay? So that's uh, sort of a philosophy underlying all this and, and that's why you know, we're going to have you actually build a geomechanical model using the kinds of data that are routinely available. So, the stresses are important typically, and I'll talk about this a lot in the next lecture. When we talk about the stress field, we're really talking about the three principal stresses which are normally acting in a vertical and horizontal plane. We refer to those stresses as SV, the vertical stress, the overburden, 
the uh, maximum horizontal stress and the minimum horizontal stress. Three principal stresses. And then to orient that, we need one angle, which is the orientation of the stresses in that horizontal plane. And that orientation is usually the azimuth of the maximum horizontal stress. So four parameters describe the stress field. And I'll explain the theoretical basis for that in the next lecture. You know, stress is a, a second order tensor. It has nine components. Um, it can be in any arbitrary coordinate system. Uh, six of those components are independent. But nonetheless, if the stress field were really, if it took us, uh, if we needed six numbers and three orientations to describe the stress field fully, uh, we wouldn't be having this course. Uh, Fortunately, for reasons I'll explain in the next lecture, the problem is, is um, reduced quite a bit. And, and it's basically four, four values that are needed to describe the stress field. But of course, we need to know the pore pressure. We need to know the rock properties. And here we're referring to the um, rock strength. But uh, we often need other rock properties, obviously, for other, other applications. And we need to know something about the fractures and the faults. We can see larger faults. Um, with you know, 3D seismic data and uh, with good data, we can see relatively small faults, but we don't see them all. And we use image logs, which are now uh, widely available to look at the smaller scale fractures and faults. And we can actually sometimes see faults of interest in core samples, et cetera. And we're going to kind of combine all this in different ways uh, to solve um, a, given, a given problem um, as, they, as they arise.